So I'll start with the fiber connectivity. Our target is 100,000 kilometers of fiber. And in this regard, our proposition is that as government, we are going to roll out 52% of that fiber and leave the rest, 48%, to the private sector. As we speak, we have managed over the past one year or so to roll out 8,743 kilometers. That number looks small for the following reason. When we came into government, we had a challenge of funding for a start. When we unlocked the funding, we faced certain bureaucratic red tapes in the course of procurement, which also um, uh, made us lose quite a bit of time. But from the time we onboarded the contractors, I believe there were 16 contractors, we have managed to do a total of 8,743 kilometers. That fell short of our annual target. Based on lessons learned over the past one year, honorable members, we have decided to rejig the implementation model for the fiber rollout. What we have done is now to leverage on the existing capacity and infrastructure within government so that we fast track the rollout of the fiber. As we speak, we have managed to contract by way of direct procurement the Kenya Power and Lighting Company. <coughs> Kenya Power has got its tran electricity transmission line spread evenly all over the country. And informed by critical thinking, our proposition is that as opposed to digging down the ground to lay all out fiber, let us leverage on the existing infrastructure of the Kenya Power and Lighting Company to equally roll out fiber. The net effect is that we are going to have the fiber up there along the existing electricity transmission lines. The net effect is that everywhere where there is a Kenya Power line, we are going to roll out the fiber line. Eventually, what it means, good people, is that if there is last mile connectivity of power to a given household, equally we are capable of having last mile connectivity of fiber and internet to those households. Now, this working arrangement is feasible for the following reasons. One, Kenya Power has got a critical mass of 300 contractors against the background of the 16 contractors that we were utilizing hitherto. Utilizing that capacity of the contractors within the ambit of Kenya Power procurement framework, as opposed to rolling out their 100,000 kilometers of fiber within a period of five years, we are now going to be able to roll out their 100,000 kilometers of fiber within a period of two years. So we will meet our targets within a very give, a short period of time. Similarly, we will leverage on the existing infrastructure of Kenya Power as we roll out the fiber to also connect Wi-Fi hotspots. Everywhere where there is a transformer, a Kenya Power transformer, and we roll out the fiber, we should also equally be able to have an internet hotspot. And we are targeting the markets, we are targeting the schools. That any time we talk about Konza, people think of Konza as a white elephant, which is not the case. In fact, this has been due to lack of information. If you go to Konza today, you'll realize that we have already rolled out the requisite vertical infrastructure in terms of the road, the water, the electricity. If you go to Konza today, we already have a fully fledged data center where both private sector 
and public sector institutions are already domiciling their data by way of, uh, of safe storage. We already have 19 private sector uh, institutions storing their data there. We already have 52 public sector institutions storing their data at the data facility in Konza. This is important, ladies and gentlemen, because in the face of digitalization, a key question that comes to mind every other day is how secure is the data that is coming into the hands of government or even the private sector through digitalization uh, processes. Recently, we did sign an agreement with the government of United Arab Emirates focusing on establishment of data centers in Kenya. And this is uh, going to be a source of foreign direct investment. Kenya is an attractive uh, destination because we have got access to renewable energy. So quite a number of global technological companies want to set up their data centers here. And what we are telling them is that we have got adequate market, adequate ready market for the data centers. The other major um, output that we have within Sconza is that we already have the requisite ICT infrastructure to the extent that our first open university, virtual university, fully fledged virtual university, is domiciled within the Konza Technopolis platform. From the time this university was opened last year, we already have 1,500 students enrolled undertaking university courses on this Konza platform, the Open University of Kenya, the first one of its kind in, in Kenya. It is amazing, good people, that if you go down to the villages today, you will witness instances where a matatu driver, when he has got 30 minutes to one hour waiting for his passengers, is logging in to the Open University to pursue university education. These big youth whom you see driving matatus, they are doing that for lack of alternative, not that they have not gone to school. Some of them have gone to school up to Form 4, and they are now joining university through virtual platforms. This again is going to be a major game changer because it's going to drastically reduce the cost of education in this country. We have gone a step further to facilitate an enabling environment for other technopolis to also come up. Smart cities. Our proposition is that Kenya, Konza is going to be our Silicon Savannah, a fully fledged smart city. There is also opportunity for other smart cities. We have already taken to cabinet a cabinet paper or memo on establishment of, um, of a bill that will facilitate a bill on the technopolis. This has been approved by cabinet and it is now going to get its way to parliament upon gazettement for purposes of legislation into an act to create um, uh, um, an enabling legal framework so that we can have as many technopolis coming up or smart cities coming up in Kenya. And this will position us effectively in the digital market. Then it also means that through the connectivity to the 100,000 institutions, we are going to overshoot our target of the rollout of the 25,000 Wi-Fi hotspots. And this will stand us in very good stead. So within a period of two years, for purposes of comfort, ladies and gentlemen, we shall have surpassed our target of rollout of the 100,000 kilometers of fiber. We shall have surpassed our target of rollout of the 25,000 Wi-Fi hotspots, and we are prioritizing those segments of the society that will have greater impact from an economy's <coughs> perspective. That is why we are starting with the markets for purposes of Wi-Fi, because that predominantly is where our mothers and sisters who are involved in the itinerary train are domiciled, and that will have the greatest impact at the grassroots levels. Let me now move to the digitalization of government <coughs> services. When we came into office one year ago, 
we only had a meter 350 services aboard the e-citizen platform. As we speak today, through concerted and sustained effort, we have managed to digitalize a total of 15,805 services, which are now available virtually on the e-citizen platform. That means we have surpassed our target threefold. Yeah? Against a target of a mega 5,000 services, we have now managed to overshoot 15,000 services. Now, why are we going this direction? We are doing this, ladies and gentlemen, because we believe that the only way of facilitating efficiency and effectiveness in service delivery to the Kenyan public is by digitalizing government services. And that is why, for a start, in this digitalization agenda again, we are giving priority to critical segments of the Kenyan economy by way of service delivery, such as Kenya Revenue Authority for purposes of tax collection, the Department of Immigrations, because that is where we have been having challenges with uh, supply of passports, IDs and the like. E-transport is another frontier. We want to go the route of e-transport. We are also prioritizing the Ministry of Lands so that we don't have challenges. We have been experiencing challenges with a clogged land registry through digitalization. We are unlocking, unlocking that. We are also focusing on e-health so that we digitalize all health services to eliminate unnecessary duplicity within the health sector where an individual goes to one health institution, is asked to do a scan, for example, goes to another institution in a different town, you are asked to do the same scan. Uh, this is duplicity and unnecessary wastage of resources. If we digitalize e the, the health services and records, we should be able to facilitate interoperability of data so that that data is accessed end to end from wherever somebody goes to hospital, but of course while also recognizing the fact that that data should remain private and secure in conformity to the data protection laws. But ultimately, ultimately, good people, if we digitalize all government services, the net effect is that one, Kenyans will be able to consume government services from the comfort of wherever they are. Even those who are abroad, they'll be able to consume all government services from abroad. They do not need to travel out here, back here home. We have been having instances of Kenyans who are resident abroad coming back here because there are certain aspects of our operations which are still minor. That will be now be water under the bridge. So service delivery one to the Kenyan public will be enhanced. Two, a critical mass, a critical mass of the population who had not yet been brought into the income bracket will now be brought into the income bracket by way of gainful economic activity. And a typical example is the Hustler Fund, where quite a number of Kenyans domiciled at the bottom of the economic pyramid have now access to the Hustler Fund while leveraging on technology. And by extension, we are going to enhance our revenue base to the extent that we should be able to collect domestically generated revenue adequate enough to sort out our external debt and even have surplus to finance both our recurrent and development expenditure. That is the horizon we are going, and that's why we are determined to go the full hog in this regard. The next frontier is the digital hubs. We are working, as I said, with members of parliament on this frontier. The honorable members of parliament have already facilitated a review of the CDF Act to the extent that they now have access to 3% of annual CDF funding to facilitate construction of premises where we can set up the hubs and also meet recurrent expenditure. What we are going to do as national government is to deploy the devices once the infrastructure is in place, facilitate internet connectivity, 
undertake the training and also connect the youth to digital jobs. Over the past one year, since embarking on this process, we started by targeting the TVETs, and we have deployed the devices, about 12,000 devices to a total of 116 uh, TVET institutions. Globally, or nationally, or in holistically, we have also managed to deploy devices in a total of 174 hubs, while integrating also the village community hubs. Our objective here is to undertake the digital skilling and also connect the youth to digital jobs. Since we started this program, ladies and gentlemen, we have managed to train a total of 390,000 plus youth who are now empowered by way of digital skills, but we have also correspondingly managed to connect over 135,000 youth to digital jobs. I want us to look at this paradigm shift from this perspective, that eventually this perhaps may be the only sustainable way of sorting out our unemployment problem, challenge in this country. That is the direction the entire globe is going and Kenya cannot be an exception. As opposed to a situation where we have rural urban migration by the youth in search of jobs, we are going to create these jobs, ladies and gentlemen, right there in the villages through digital platforms. It is amazing that young people who completed fourth form education, perhaps last year, six months down the line, are today earning up to an equivalent of 200,000 shillings per month through digital jobs, and they are paid in dollars. So we are going to have a situation, and this will be a major load off the back of honorable members of parliament, because this is one of the biggest challenges MPs are facing, demand for jobs by the youth. So we are going to create the jobs right there in the village. In each and every ward, we are going to have a digital laboratory. Each and every hub can accommodate, by way of training, a total of 100 youth. We are capable of doing three shifts in each hub. That means, cumulatively, we should be able to train 300 youth in each hub and create a, a, a corresponding number of jobs. On average, each constituency has about five words. So in each constituency, our proposition, ladies and gentlemen, is that we should be able to create a total of 1,500 jobs within each and every constituency in this country. Within the next one year or so, we should be able to create one million jobs. Eventually, once these youth earn and save, they will be able to move out of these hubs and go out there and set up, set up their own digital hubs. And as opposed to being job seekers, they will become entrepreneurs, employers of other people, as opposed to being job seekers. The other relevant aspect or integral aspect of this program is that as opposed to going the full hog all the way through the traditional education line up to university, then we let our youth start looking for jobs with the result that most of those who have gone up to university are sitting with us looking for jobs, sitting with us in our own houses. This program allows the youth to start earning when they are still, uh, still, still learning. It transitions them from learners to instant earners in the digital space. This is a major, major game changer, ladies and gentlemen, and all factors being held constant, this is going to have fundamental impact on the economy of this country. Then the next issue or question that we need to ask ourselves is, if we roll out this level of digital public infrastructure, we have the fiber connectivity, we have the internet, connectivity, we have commensurate level of digital skilling among the Kenyan population, do we still need to get Kenyans to physically visit government offices to consume the services? And the answer is no. That is why, as government again, we are pursuing a, vet, a virtual mechanism 
through which government can confirm that you are whom you claim to be. As opposed to flashing a physical identity card, we are going to have a virtual mechanism of confirming that each and every Kenyan is the person he or she claims to be. We have embarked on that process in earnest. And whenever we talk about this, people go back and reinvent the issues of Oduma number. We are not talking about Oduma number here. What we are saying is that we should have a virtual mechanism of identifying Kenyans as opposed to a physical identity card. That has, what has been done in many parts of the world, it's been done in Estonia, it's been done in India, it has been done in Pakistan, Singapore, just to mention but a few. There is no logic or reason why Kenya should be an exception in this regard. The next question, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to pose is, if we are digitalizing all government services with the ultimate objective that Kenyans should be able to consume services from wherever they are, do all Kenyans have access to smart enabled telephones to facilitate this, or as a prerequisite for this, or to lay the foundation for this? And the answer is unequivocal, no, as we speak. And therefore, as government, again proactively, we have partnered with the private sector to embark on assembly of cheap, smart, enabled telephones. We have got a local assembly plant, which is owned by telecommunication companies, plus the private sector. This local assembly plant, which is based in Mlolongo, was launched sometime last year, uh, late last year, I think it was 30th of October. From the time this assembly plant was launched, up to this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, that plant, which is now attained an optimal capacity utilization level, has managed to employ 310 Kenyans. But the most positive aspect or output of this process is that they have already managed to churn into the Kenyan market a total of 330,000 smart enabled telephones going for a unit cost of about $50, $50 per unit. In terms of consumption, that phone, it's called the Neon phone, has been sold through Safaricom and Jami Telecom outlets to the level of 268,000 units. That means there's market demand for cheap smart enabled telephones. Ultimately, at optimal capacity utilization levels, we envisage that the plant will be able to produce 4,500 units of telephones each and every day. And this will definitely meet the market demand. Our proposition is that in the long run, which is not in the so distant future, as opposed to local assembly of the telephone, we should now be able as a country to embark on manufacture of the cheap, smart, enabled telephones. And as opposed to operating from Mulolongo, we have already discussed with the facility, and they have agreed that this will be one of the major private sector investments that we are going to have within our Konza Technopolis. While in still in that space, let me also mention, on the side of Kenya Broadcasting Corporation and the Postal Corporation of Kenya, for POSTA, we are very clear in our mind that if we roll out the requisite digital public infrastructure, the direction that we need to go is to position Postal Corporation of Kenya as an e-commerce and a logistics hub, as opposed to just undertaking the traditional courier business. Because they do no, no longer have comparative advantage in that space. We already have an e-commerce policy and a bail in place. We are progressing it to cabinet upon enactment, upon passing by cabinet, it will get its way to, to parliament. We already also have, working in tandem with the Ministry of Trade, an e-commerce strategy, which we launched early this year. We have also put in place, or developed already good people, a national addressing system 
policy and bail, on the basis of which our e-commerce strategy can be anchored. That e-commerce policy and bill again is progressing to cabinet, then eventually um, it will undergo the requisite processes and it gets its way to parliament for purposes of legislation. That is our overall strategy for revitalization of postal cooperation of Kenya, to turn it into an e-commerce and logistics hub. As we speak, we are undertaking trainers, training of trainers for an integral component of postal staff in the area of e-commerce. We are also engaging private sector players for purposes of partnership on e-commerce platforms. The other fundamental uh, achievement we have realized is that while leveraging on internally generated resources through last mile deliveries, we already have a working arrangement with the Department of Immigration through which we facilitate last mile delivery of passports. We have an arrangement with Kenya Medical Supplies Agency through which we facilitate last delivery of medical supplies. We are now collecting adequate internally generated revenues to the extent that we are able to meet some of our integral recurrent expenditure. As at December 23rd last year, we managed to pay 435 million shillings to POSTA staff to sort out a backlog of five months salary, historical issue, which has been perennial within the ambit of operations of the Postal Corporations of Kenya. Moving forward, we believe that salary delays will be a thing of the past if we can have this diversified revenue streams. On the side of the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, we are clear that two things need to happen. One, we need to have a distinction or a demarcation between the commercial aspect of KBC and the public good aspect of KBC by way of provision of public information or information to the Kenyan public. To facilitate this, one, we need to upgrade the infrastructure of the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation so that it is in tandem with market demands. We need to reorient the content that we are turning out of the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. We need also to upgrade the studios that is work in progress and then we need to work on staff morale and staff motivation. All these good people is work in process. We are also revitalizing the operations of the government, gov re-engineering the operations of the government advertising agency. When we came into office, good people, we owed the media houses about 1.7 billion shillings. 1.7 billion shillings. And this kept on accumulating. In fact, we were spending on a weekly basis about 17 million shillings through my gov advertisement, both printing of my gov and also circulation. There are questions that you need to ask. One question is, one, why do you go out to the private sector to print my gov? While within government itself, you have got institutions who can do the printing. We have got the Kenya yearbook, you have got the Kenya Literature Bureau, you have got the government press. Then you ask yourself, is that the rational thing to do? That is one. Two, why do you go to the private sector to circulate my gov? Yet within government itself, Postal Corporation of Kenya has got the requisite infrastructure to do this. That is another question. Three, ultimately in the face of digitalization, do we still need to do print advertisement? Those are the fundamental questions that at the end of the day we need to ask ourselves. But as a short term measure, what we have done is to subject that process of printing and circulation of my gov to a competitive process based on the procurement law. Where people bid, we, when we came to the office, we got this lopsided arrangement 
where the painting and circulation of my gap was being shared among various media houses. And I asked myself, which law is this? Because there is no provision in law which says that when you float any tender, you go ahead and divide or subdivide the scope of that tender to all the bidders. That is not there in the procurement law. It's not there in the procurement law. That you float any tender, you get 50 or 60 bidders, divide the scope of that tender among the bidders. That is not there in the procurement law. So as a short-term measure, we have subjected that my gov printing and circulation to a competitive process. That tender has been awarded to the lowest bidder, and this has led to a dramatic or fundamental reduction in the cost of printing of my gov from a whopping 17 million shillings per week to 9 million shillings per week. We are also now in the process as a means of diversifying the revenue streams of the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation to churn a substantial proportion of the digital advertisement to KBC, being a government institution. But ultimately, we will migrate everything to the digital space. There is no point, no logic, in doing printing, print advertising while the target population has already, without notice, migrated to the digital space. We have to follow them there. That's what we are going to do eventually. Now, all these interventions, good people, must be anchored on a sound policy, legal, and regulatory perspective. As we speak, quite a number of our institutions are operating on the basis of legal mandates. We have to come up with requisite legislation by way of acts of parliament on the basis of which we can anchor some of our institutions. A case in point is ICTA, another one is CONSA, another one is uh, Kenya Institute of Mass Communication. Again, that is work in progress. Eventually, this will end up in parliament by way of bill, and we will be seeking your support so that we have these institutions anchored on act of parliament so that they have got the requisite legal foundation to enable them uh, effectively execute their mandate. Over and above that, there are also aspects where we have realized that there are fundamental legal gaps. And what we have done as a ministry, in a proactive manner again, in reaction to what is happening in our operational environment, we have some time back, about six months ago, set up a sector working group consisting of officers from the ministry and the private sector to look at our operational environment, scan the emerging issues, so that in a proactive manner again they can give us recommendations as to areas where we need to strengthen our policy, legal and regulatory framework so that we are not caught off guard in the face of dynamism in our operational environment. Look at some of the emerging issues like the AI in the ICT space, Internet of Things, issues of big data, issues of cyber security. We must start having this discussion with people. And that is why we set up this ICT sector working group. It is uh, predominantly private sector trigger, but with support from officers within the ministry. And we brought on board all the players. They gave us a draft report. They have gone back now to revise the draft report. In another couple of weeks, they will give us recommendations on what aspects need to be looked at by way of policies, laws, and regulations in line with what is happening globally, and of course, while benchmarking with global best practices so that we remain relevant, if not competitive, in the ICT technological landscape. But just in a nutshell, let me elucidate some of the glaring areas where we have realized that there are legal gaps. One, in the space, before I come to that, something also fundamental. Kenya is becoming 
a destination of choice for purposes of hosting international conferences. From 21st to 25th of this month, we are hosting the Connected Africa Summit. In May, we are hosting an international summit on data governance, driven by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. In August, we have won the right to host the Transform Africa Summit. In September, we are hosting the International Association of Science Parks, hosted by Konza Technopolis. These are events which we have won the right to host through our competitive processes. And the import of this is that internationally, everybody is recognizing the ICT developments that Kenya is introducing. We have also recently uh, been privileged or accorded the privilege by the International Telecommunications Union to host a global innovation center. Global Innovation Center. Just informed by some of the efforts that we have put in place uh, over the past one year. So we are in good state. We are in good state. Um, in terms of the legal gaps, digital skilling is one area. We need to undertake, apart from the digital skilling we are doing for the youth, we need to undertake digital skilling even for the members of the public the Kenyan public, because that's the only way they are going to consume these virtual services that we are putting in place as government. We need to think of a framework that can support the nationwide digital skilling program for purposes of effective coordination, both at the national government level and also the county government level. Because as a national government, there is no program that we are going to undertake which will not be undertaken in a given county. So we must work in tandem with the counties in all aspects of our digital transformation agenda. The other area where we need to think proactively is the space of data sharing. Even among government institutions itself, it's becoming a challenge. One government institution has got data, does not want to share with another one. There's a lot of duplicity of effort and wastage of resources. That is an area, again, where we need to have a, dis a discussion. How do we manage our data, or how do we share data amongst ourselves as government institutions, or between government and the private sector? And of course, in full conformity to the provisions of the Data Protection Act 2019, so that that data remains both private and secure. In the digital economy space, which is a new frontier for us, Take, for example, the business process outsourcing companies. We have got thousands and thousands of youth who are working in that space, but without proper legislation. Because here are youth who are working for one company in the morning, in the afternoon they are working for another company, in the evening they are doing their own thing there. We do not have proper legislation for purposes of business process outsourcing. Our legal, our legal foundation still assumes that we are going to work for one organization, it's still talking of things like permanent and pensionable or contract. How do we legislate the process of business process outsourcing? It is not just a challenge for us, it is also a challenge for the global technological companies who are providing the digital jobs. So we need to think together and see how to facilitate that. The other gap, of course, which I mentioned earlier is the national addressing system. The direction we are going is e-commerce. Today, we want to turn all our markets into digital marketplaces. We no longer need to have a physical interface between the seller of a commodity and the buyer of a commodity. That mom and burger who is at the market should be able to take a photo of the burger he, she or she has got on that day, post it on the digital platform. The customer will see it there virtually. They agree on the price through the telephone. Payment is made by M-Pesa. We have fast, fast last line for delivery. Then the public relations and communications front. We are dealing with a situation where all those who are practicing within the realm of public relations, they call themselves public relations consultants or practitioners, have been operating without a law, an enabling law. There are no confines or regulations or guidelines which articulate who qualifies to be a public relations practitioner. 
We did a cabinet memo. It has been passed in parliament, uh, in cabinet. It has now, it has been gazetted. It has now progressed to parliament. We are seeking your support to have this um, passed into law uh, as soon as possible so that we can regulate that space of public relations and communications. Then the other issue is the media landscape. The new media, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Netflix, we need to regulate this space. Again, we need certain attendant laws. Just the same way we have got laws which regulate what can be posted or churned out through television stations or radio for that matter. More so to protect our youth, we must come up with attendant legislations that can strengthen the regulatory framework in the digital space so that we don't overexpose our youth to harmful material. A lot of concerns have been raised in this regard and we need to think together as members of the ICT family from both government and the, I mean the, the executive and the legislature so that we come up with the requisite legislations. And also think of how to manage issues of disinformation or misinformation in the digital space. We need some legislations in that place so that we have very stringent measures to deal with that. In terms of institutional reforms, I've mentioned we need strong legal foundation for KIMC, CONSA, ICTA, just to mention but a few. But there are also instances where we do not have a clear mandates. For example, the, uh, the, uh, the Media Council of Kenya, on one hand, and the Media Complaint <coughs> Commission on the other. Today, those two institutions are operating as if the Media Complaints Commission is an appendage or subordinate to the Media Council of Kenya, which it is supposed to regulate complaints against in terms of operations. It relies on funding from the Media Complaints, uh, Media Council of Kenya, and even other operational aspects. We need to have a clear demarcation in that space. The other challenge we are facing is the operations of some of the institutions that we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis their relationship with the ministry. The Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, for example, is supposed to be independent. And based by the, on that independence, or informed by that need for independence, the only reporting mechanism that we have is that the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner is supposed to report, by way of a report, to the ministry once in a year. Once in a year. And what the cabinet secretary is expected to do is to transmit the report to the National Assembly. So the ministry in that regard is just a conveyor belt. In between through the year, there is no legal basis through which there can be an interaction between the office and the data protection commissioner and the ministry. Yet that very ministry, by way of policy formulation, is supposed to come up with an overall policy framework uh, for the entire sector, including but not limited to issues of data protection. So what we are asking ourselves, and this is an issue for debate, is it possible that we can come up with some governance framework for the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner to strengthen governance oversight and reporting relationship between the ministry and that office? That is just a question. It is something that we need to think, to think about. Come to the Communications Authority of Kenya vis-a-vis -vis the Universal Service Advisory Council. The law states that the minister, the cabinet secretary, appoints members of the Universal Service Advisory Council. It's at the whims of the minister. When we came into office for eight years, the law had that provision. The cabinet secretary or previous cabinet secretary had not appointed members of the Universal Service Advisory Council. We have gone ahead to correct that anomaly, and now we have got a Universal Service Advisory Council in place. But the issue here is the Communications Authority Act, under which the Universal Service Advisory Council is domiciled, stipulates 
that the Universal Service Advisory Council will provide technical guidance to the board of the communications authority. Now, if that is the case, then there are two questions which come to mind. To what extent, by way of operations, can the Universal Service Advisory Council be independent? And in terms of reporting relationship, when does the Universal Service Advisory Council report to the board of the Communications Authority and when does the Universal Service Advisory Council report to the Cabinet Secretary as the appointing authority? That same Universal Service Advisory Council is supported by a secretariat consisting of members or staff of the Communications Authority of Kenya. So there are, there's a bit of cleaning up that needs to be done in that space. Again, I'm just posing these questions for purposes of proactive thinking moving forward. And of course, also we need to benchmark with what is happening in other jurisdictions.